So I'd like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's Workers World Party Forum on the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution in this meeting for revolutionaries today. My name is Christian, and I'll be chairing the meeting. The... You can applaud that. <laughs> the first talk will be given by our Workers World Party organizer, Taryn Feivik, on hope in the belly of the beast. And I'll be followed by um, talks from two Workers World Party secretary members, Deirdre Griswold, the editor of Workers World Newspaper and a founding member of the party, and Larry Holmes, the first secretary of Workers World Party. And so we can begin with Taryn. Hi, comrades. Hi. Happy centennial. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'll try not to go on for too long. It's just four pages. First of all, it's a real, like, extreme pleasure to be here in this room with everyone on this really important centennial day. Like, it really kind of, like, gives me a, a feeling of a lot of, like, hope and love to be in a room with so many people who, who know how important this day is and what it means to people all over the world. So, it's been a wild year for everyone. We started off by being in the streets and seeing thousands in the streets of D.C. for January 20th when Trump was sworn in as President of the United States. What has followed is a year of historic fight back. Starting with J20, when protesters militantly raised the banner of anti-racism, anti-imperialism, and anti-capitalism, we have seen people take the streets again and again to push back whatever avalanche of terror against our class this regime sends our way. The JFK and hands-off Syria mobilizations are good examples. Charlottesville is a good example. Durham is a great example. But while our presence in the streets has been militant, immediate, and vanguard-like in its formation, it has not stopped the response of the state, which has likewise been forceful. More than 200 protesters were kettled and arrested on J20. They were facing up to 80 years in jail on felony riot charges. Our comrades and friends were beaten and arrested for insisting that the US must keep its filthy hands off Syria. We watched bricks thrown, hammers literally falling on us, gas, and a murder happen in Charlottesville. I remember sitting on the B-38 bus in Brooklyn crying as I watched my comrades being arrested in Durham. I remember hearing them chant as they were led away in handcuffs. My heart was heavy with pride and love. Now in the news I see that the ruling class wants to accuse me and my people of being puppets of some foreign government. But you know, Puerto Rico still doesn't have power. ICE arrests children from hospitals and killer cop Daniel Pantaleo watches the game and draws his six-figure salary. Our class struggles against gentrification, poverty, addiction, incarceration, the racist police, and things seem to get harder and harder. I think of what a candidate comrade said in this room, that the homeless shelter they work for has more than 60 people sleeping upright in chairs every night because they don't have enough beds. It can all seem overwhelming and demoralizing. So in the depth of this sort of despair, so deep in the belly of the beast that we are, what gives us hope? It's sort of a corny word, actually, hope. It feels like it's a weak position to have. We know that we will win. That's revolutionary optimism, right? Revolutionary optimism is looking around at the world and saying, and knowing for sure that this is, can't continue indefinitely, that this just can't continue on forever. As dialectical materialists, we know that everything in this world is presently in a process of change. But when we stand in the streets and chant, I believe that we will win, we're chanting about hope. It's that feeling in your chest. It's that dizzy kind of love for our class. So since it's my honor to speak to y'all on the day of our centennial, of our 100 year celebration of socialist revolution, I think we should ask what makes someone caught up in all this horror feel a sense of deep pride and love in the revolution that took place in Russia 100 years ago. It was not the first revolution where the oppressed people threw off their chains, and it certainly was not the last. But what about this and all other revolutions can give the people struggling for our lives in the belly of the beast hope? We are exhausted. The challenges we face seem gargantuan in scope, but our class has faced all this and more and achieved real victories. They have shown us the way. Their battles won an incredible odds surmounted give us hope. When we talk about the Russian Revolution, or the Haitian Revolution, the incredible Vietnamese victory over US imperialism, Mao winning after decades of struggle, Fidel arriving in Havana victorious, the Soviet flag hoisted over the Reichstag during the liberation of Berlin, we are actually talking about family history. 
We all sit in this room as products of this revolutionary heritage. We are guided by heroes. In Russia, the Bolsheviks were illegal. Lenin was in hiding. The peasantry and working class were hardly literate and lived in the most squalid of conditions. They were stuck in the middle of what was then the most bloody war in all of European history, with youth after youth being sent to the front to die the most undignified and useless, meaningless deaths. Our leaders were scattered throughout the world, on the run. There were no laws in place to protect people's rights to assemble, the right to free speech, or what have you. Unions were illegal. How then did our forces win the sweetest of victories in 1917? It was because they were organized. They were a tightly disciplined and yet totally adaptive organization, a Leninist party, led by the best and brightest of the working class and oppressed. They smashed through whatever the ruling class put in their path because the Soviet Union was a revolution whose time had come. The people had no choice but to get organized. Putting faith in the working class and oppressed took an enormous amount of heart, but they did it. Moreover, they understood the dire necessity for the vanguard to win the trust of the working class and oppressed. By raising the banner of peace, land, and bread through tireless militant effort and organizing, the Bolsheviks helped deliver a power to the world that would defeat Nazi Germany and, by its very nature, enforce a balance of power that resulted in peaceful development and progressive gains throughout the world. It's only through organization and through the party forum that we can accomplish our history's most necessary task, smashing white supremacy, abolishing capitalism, and the immediate implementation of socialism. I'm not overstating our situation to say that humanity stands on the brink of destruction. It's our job, those of us who are revolutionaries, those of us who are in this room and in this city to band together to slay this beast. No one else will do this. It really is up to us. Last year I watched the election from overseas. I remember waking up the next morning and having an honest heart-to-heart -heart with my friend at the time. We honestly did not know when we would see each other again. I remember going to the airport with a sense of extreme dread in the pit of my stomach, seeing all the tabloids laid out in front of the gate with the most horrific headlines about Trump's election. The prospect of sitting on a plane with people who may have voted for him terrified me. I don't know how I got that flight, but I do know that I walked off that plane and right into the annual party conference. <laughs> that despair was quickly and swiftly replaced by the love, strength, and camaraderie of this party. From many disparate in individuals wracked with anxiety about the future, we all together formed a revolutionary fist that delivered us victory after victory this year. I remember what Comrade Larry Holmes said at an open house we had a few weeks ago, that a party like ours is able to accomplish so much with our small numbers because exactly that we are organized. We strategize with one another. We consult. We tirelessly have each other's backs. Here is a cause for hope. 100 years after the Russian Revolution, its very specter still haunts the ruling class. The bourgeois media had to run smear after smear against it. The New York Times even had a regular series dedicated to it this year. They've been telling me that socialism is dead since the collapse of the Soviet Union, but we see that the very idea of socialism still invigorates our class and terrifies our enemies to their very bones. The task at hand for those who don't know yet is to get organized. The incredible growth of this party in this phase is a vindication and affirmation of our line on the national question and special oppression, our analysis of capitalism at a dead end, and our culture of consultation. Every new candidate, every new friend, every new subscriber or reader of our newspaper is a vote of confidence from our class. I look at the incredible caliber of my comrades who have been in this struggle for decades, or even just for a few months, and I feel confidence. We are educated, dedicated, loving, contemplative, and militant cadre. I look at the hundreds of thousands who have taken to the streets against white supremacy, and I feel love and hope. On the anniversary of the centennial of the Russian Revolution, looking at our conditions and theirs, I believe that we are again coming up on a turning point in history. When we are organized and when we struggle, we win. This year's Workers World Conference will be one of the most important in our party's history. We will be gathering to report back on our struggles and victories so far, share skills and perspectives with our comrades and friends, and strategize our way forward. Youth from across the United States will be there, ready to pick each other back up, dust each other back off, pat each other on the back, and consult with and encourage each other to keep fighting. It will take place in what certainly seems to be, at least to someone my age, rather dire times, and in the occupied city of Newark. But if it's one thing that this city has, uh, sorry, if it's one thing that this year has shown me, it's that my faith in our class and in this party has been vindicated time after time again. 
I believe that we are faithfully carrying the spirit of the Russian Revolution into this next phase of history, and that gives us confidence and hope. And I really do believe that we will win. So I'll see y'all at the conference. discussions at the end of all the speakers and afterwards everyone's invited to stay for a delicious meal that's being prepared by Sharon and also for a red social thank you so now I just have a quick announcement for an event coming up um, the office opens our doors to the most important meeting next weekend we have um, flyers at the front so join us next Sunday November 12th for a 2 p.m. program called resistance occupation, and political prisoners. Coming just before the annual December 9th Philadelphia rally in Teaching for Mumia, the New York Free Mumia Coalition sponsors next Sunday's forum here to include an update on Mumia and more about the December 9th Philadelphia plans by Pam Africa, Minister of Confrontation of the MOVE organization, and other speakers, speakers including John Catt, talking about his book, Turn the Guns Around, and Professor Joanna Fernandez of the Campaign to Bring Mumia Home with Henry Haggins of the New York Free Media Coalition, connecting these issues after examples of struggle versus racism in the U.S. imperialism the GIs with next week's Sunday showing of Sir No Sir film here. The timing for media support is so critical. Come next Sunday and get bus tickets for a trip to Philadelphia on December 9th. The bus leaving from this office. See Jill for more information on this free and important ride to Philadelphia for Mumia. Next, we'll be hearing from the first of our secretary speakers. We'll be hearing from Deirdre Griswold, the editor of the Workflow newspaper and a founding member of the Workers' Rogue Party. Comrades and friends, um, I think uh, Karen made this task a little easier for me. I want you to try and imagine really deeply what it was like in the Tsarist Empire a hundred years ago that caused the Russian Revolution to take place. Are you saying that this should be up, down? Up a little. Okay, is that better? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, there was a terrible war going on in Europe. It was the first one that could truly be called a world war because 32 capitalist countries were involved. The U.S. joined the war late on the side of Britain, France, Italy, and Belgium, all of them colonial powers, as well as Tsarist Russia and Japan and they were known as the Allies. And on the other side were what was called the Central Powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Turkey, and Bulgaria. They didn't have many colonies, and that's what that war was about. Who would get to super exploit the masses of people in Asia, Africa, and Latin America? So tens of millions of people, working people, were dying in Europe, both soldiers and civilians. It was a horrendous bloodbath on behalf of the ruling classes, and it seemed like it would go on forever. And then something totally unexpected happened in Russia. The poorest and most underdeveloped of all the countries in that war. The people rose up and overthrew the government that had pushed them into this unbelievable slaughter. Actually, there were two revolutions in Russia that year, one in February and the other in October by their calendar, November by ours. The one in February 
was touched off by massive demonstrations of women textile workers. It led to an end to czarist rule and the setting up of a bourgeois capitalist democracy. The old repressive czarist police were gone and organizations of the workers, the peasants, the soldiers, which had been illegal, could now meet openly in their Soviets, which is just the Russian word for councils. And at those meetings, they would debate everything and set out a course of action. But more than anything else, what they wanted was an end to the war, Russia's participation in the war. But this capitalist government that was set up after Fe the February Revolution was weak, and it didn't change anything fundamental. It kept Russia in the war, sending soldiers and sailors to the front to die. Why? Because the Russian capitalist class wanted its share of the spoils of war. And they would let the people be slaughtered for that. And at the same time, those workers and peasants who hadn't been drafted to fight continued to be worked half to death in the fields and the factories to enrich the bosses and landlords. So what happened in those few months between the two revolutions? Well, the Soviets kept moving to the left, electing more and more deputies who represented the Bolshevik party, Lenin's party. Meanwhile, the provisional bourgeois government was making concessions to the old regime. So in November came a second revolution the one we are celebrating today. Armed workers and soldiers took over the palaces and declared a government of the Soviets. It was a wake-up call to the ruling classes everywhere. They were shocked, just as if an electric current had run through them. Who were these Bolsheviks who led this revolution? How could it be that impoverished workers and illiterate peasants who flocked to that party believed that they could run this big country? But the revolutionaries got right down to business, and they took over the property of the merchants, the industrialists, the landowners, declaring it to be the property of the people. And they pulled Russia out of the World War even though it meant yielding territory to Germany, temporarily, because they later wanted that. Well, the howls from the ruling classes all over the capitalist world turned to screams of rage. Workers in other countries, who had also been forced to fight each other in the war, which was still going on, heard about what was happening in Russia. Some got the idea that maybe we could do it too. There were several uprisings led by communists in other European countries, but they were all defeated. The revolution was also spreading from the Russian part of the Tsarist Empire to the other nationalities and regions that were held under the sway of Tsarist Tsarism. The people spoke many languages, some were Europeans, some were Asians, but they came together as comrades in the struggle against their oppressors. So the imperialist powers had to act fast. In 1918, less than a year after the revolution, 14 imperialist countries, including the United States, sent armies to try and crush the revolution. They fought against the revolution for two years. But it didn't work. The Red Army, plus local militias, defeated both their own homegrown counter-revolutionaries who had started a civil war, and the imperialist armies that had invaded. So by 1920, that war was over and the revolution had won. But in order to understand what, understand the, the development of the Soviet Union, its problems as well as its successes, we need to know that that end to the Civil War was by no means an end to imperialist intervention. From then on, the USSR was the target, the main target, of all the powerful capitalist countries. 
When Germany later was gearing up for war in the late 1930s, the Western so-called democracies encouraged Hitler to expand to the East, not to the West. That was the meaning of the Munich Pact, signed by the prime ministers of Britain and France with Hitler in 1938. After that agreement with the Western imperialists, Germany first invaded Czechoslovakia, and then, two years later, invaded the USSR in June of 1941. Now this invasion, called Operation Barbarossa, this German attack on the Soviet Union, was the biggest invasion ever in world history, before or after 1921, uh, 1941. Four and a half million German soldiers marched into the USSR along an 1,800 mile front from north to south. The fascist imperialists killed some 25 million Soviet people in World War II. But when it was finally over, it was the Soviet Red Army, not the US or Britain or France, that pushed the Nazis out of Eastern Europe, captured Berlin, tore down the swastika, and hung a red flag on top of the Russia. that these fascists are still around, these Nazis. Did the USSR then have time to rebuild after the terrible devastation of World War II? Not really. Just one year later, in 1946, the US and Britain officially began a Cold War, which lasted until the breakup of the Soviet Union. We are celebrating the great Bolshevik Revolution today, even though there is no longer a Soviet Union. When it disintegrated in 1991, many in the left movement here were stunned, and they abandoned Marxism and Leninism. Our party did not. We never had a utopian view of the Soviet Union. It was not perfect socialism regardless of what was said officially. We recognized the deep problems that existed. Sam Marcy, who was the founder and ideological leader of our party from 1959 until his death, wrote a great deal about these problems. You can find his writings in the books section of our website, workers.org. His book on perestroika goes over the many failings that had developed, particularly regarding the national question some of which led to internal wars and rebellions. But if there's one thought I hope you will take away with you this afternoon, it is this. The fact that the Soviet Union lasted for 74 years, despite everything the imperialists did to destroy it, is an incredible testament to the strength of the working class and the struggle for socialism. beyond the shadow of a doubt that a state based upon the working class and the formerly oppressed peoples with a planned economy is vastly superior to capitalism, even if its development has been distorted and concessions made to the class enemies. You only have to look at the terrible period that followed the dismantling of the USSR. The workers of all the nationalities, especially, I think, in what had formerly been oppressed by Tsarism, they suffered terribly as the state-owned enterprises were gobbled up by both corrupt party officials and the, but mainly by the imperialists. Every social index, life expectancy, unemployment, disease, drunkenness, addiction, the condition of women, infant mortality, all, all of it showed that the workers were in the deepest crisis once the Soviet Union fell. We live in this big, rich, imperialist country. 
just troops and weapons all over the capitalist world. But we need to think very seriously about what the USSR had to go through. The last time a war was fought on our soil was the Civil War. It lasted just four years. 620,000 people died. And the whole country was traumatized. The war ended slavery, but it didn't end white supremacy, as we all know. And the winners of that war, the industrialists and bankers of the North, went on to become rich imperialists who then exploited the whole world. By contrast, the USSR was at war not for just four years, but for almost its entire existence. World War I, the Civil War, the imperialist intervention during the, the 20s, World War II, and then 45 years of the Cold War, which forced the Soviet government to, dispend, to spend billions on defense. The only breathing space it got, really, was when the capitalist world was plunged into the Great Depression. That's when the USSR started to forge ahead with its five-year plans, its industrialization, and its collectivization of agriculture. In the very early years of the revolution, the Bolsheviks had gotten rid of the repressive czarist laws that kept women in bondage. The Soviet Union was the first, very first country in the world to make divorce, as well as abortion, available and free on demand. It organized laundries, cafeterias, and childcare, so women could be freed from household drudgery. It also was the first country to abolish the laws criminalizing same-sex love. But later in the 1930s, some of the giant steps forward that had been taken at the beginning of the revolution were pulled back, not all the way, but partly back. Laws were passed, again, making sexual relations between men, not women, illegal, which was the norm at that time in all the capitalist countries. It became harder to get a divorce, legal abortions were available only when the mother's life was in danger. Again, like capitalist laws. That happened in the mid-30s. However, women continued to get much more assistance from the state in child rearing, education, and job training than in much richer imperialist countries. By the 70s, 70% 70 of the doctors in the USSR were women. The first female astronaut, as you know, was a woman up in space. You must also remember that even while it was struggling to build up its economy after severe underdevelopment and wartime destruction, <laughs> the USSR was giving aid to countries fighting imperialism. In supporting the Cuban Revolution, it went as far as a military confrontation with the US, the so-called Missile Crisis, which ended when the Kennedy administration agreed not to invade Cuba again they had already done once and lost. The USSR aided the liberation movements in Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Namibia, and South Africa. It helped the Ethiopian revolution. I was there, I saw it. It supported Vietnam, and it intervened militarily in support of the revolutionary government in Afghanistan when the CIA armed and trained a reactionary army of the warlords there. Yes, Afghanistan had a very progressive government in the 1980s. And look at what the U.S. did to it. For the first 31 years of its existence, the Soviet Union had stood alone as the only country in the world attempting to build socialism. Then, in 1948, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was founded, followed one year later by People's China. Ever since then, the main objective of the imperialists has been to break up the solidarity among these countries, just as it is doing today regarding China and the Korea. 
It uses the carrot, but mostly the stick, the very big stick of threatening nuclear war, and not for the first time. We pay tribute to the Russian Revolution today, fully recognizing all the great difficulties that wore down the party and the people. It was the first socialist revolution to succeed and take power and hold it. And like the first airplane invented by the Wright brothers, it eventually crashed. But taking a scientific approach to social development is for us just as important as the science of aerodynamics was to Orville and Wilbur Wright. When their plane crashed, they didn't conclude that flight was impossible. <laughs> they studied the reasons for it and built a better plane. The Russian Revolution happened when the imperialists were at each other's throats in a great world war. But imperialism as a system was at that time in a period of great growth. It brought new technology to the whole world. But why? In order to dominate and exploit the millions of people it oppressed, in order to further enrich a tiny class of billionaires. Now, that system is choking on its own productivity. It is daily eliminating millions of jobs, even as profits soar. In this country, it can't even build a decent transportation system, let alone make housing available to the working class. And the politicians created and trained by the billionaire class are trying to take away what few reforms have been won, even as the gap between rich and poor is greater than ever. These are all symptoms of a capitalist system in decline, hated the world over. Look at the UN vote on the US blockade of, so of socialist Cuba. 100 countries against the US, just the US and Israel for it. That's how hated it is. And if you read the speeches of the delegates, they're pretty strong. The relative stability of capitalism that followed two imperialist world wars <laughs> is cracking up. Movements have arisen to challenge racism and police repression, attacks on immigrants, the destruction of the environment, all products of capitalism, which has become a dirty word. As revolutionaries, we know that all this can only be truly changed when the workers and oppressed people take the power into their own hands, as happened in Russia in 1917. The US has been the greatest obstacle to world revolution and the building of socialism since 1917. Now, progressives in this country have the greatest opportunity to organize the struggle against capitalism, the greatest opportunity since the Depression. It's what the oppressed of the world have long been hoping for. For when U.S. imperialism is torn down, the long nightmare of capitalist wars, racism, and exploitation will end, and all humanity will be the winner. So we can, I think we got energy to give her one more round. So before our next speaker, I have another announcement. This time on the National Day of Mourning. Each year since 1970, indigenous people have gathered at Plymouth Rock to commemorate a National Day of Mourning on so-called Thanksgiving, a holiday which reminds us of the genocide of millions of native people theft of their lands, and assault on their cultures. On that day, indigenous people honored their ancestors and the unity of indigenous peoples worldwide, and they raised the struggles of indigenous people today against racism, homophobia, oppression, and the profit-driven destruction of the earth. 
This year, participants at Day of Mourning will show solidarity with their sisters and brothers and siblings in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean and Mexico who are suffering from hurricane and earthquake devastation on top of colonialism. There will be a march, rally, and wonderful potluck dinner. The Solidarity Center will have a bus to Plymouth on November 23rd, leaving at 6 a.m., returning that night. Tickets will be available, and you can put your name on a list now so you can see Cosmia to you sign up to go and arrangements can be made on ticket costs. Now, for next and last speaker, we have Larry Holmes, the first secretary of Brooksville Party, who has given a couple of speeches in the past. So let's give him a warm welcome. The speeches you heard are better than what I'm going to say, I, I think. Um, I, I got a very special gift a few weeks ago. Uh, the comrades in Durham, who are very busy for obvious reasons, uh, defending themselves against the state, the whole statue thing, uh, they invited me to, to come down and speak on the centenary of the Russian Revolution. I'm not sure. Okay. It's relatively short notice, but I was honored to do it. And uh, they, they got a church, and uh, it was a, a good-sized crowd. Church wasn't filled, but good people. And the audience was, to my recollection, uh, young, black, queer, uh, very much representative of the militants who are leading the struggle today against white supremacy, shutting down stuff, pulling down statues. And, you know, I, I stepped back for a second. I said, oh my goodness, you know, how, what, should I, how, what should my approach be? Explaining the Russian Revolution. Uh, it, it might have been self-consciousness. Uh, Probably everybody was interested in anything that anyone had to say on the Russian Revolution. But I was worried about the cultural disconnect and the historical disconnect, you know. And I remember that for myself when I became radicalized 45 years earlier. The Soviet Union was still around and the global class struggle, you know, the, was very different because of that and this. The liberation movements uh, were very much, you know, at the center of things. But, you know, I, I, I wasn't very political. I, I, actually, I was radicalized over a period of about 90 days, of, uh, from being totally disinterested in politics to wanting the revolution as soon as possible. And that was when I went home and saw a draft notice that said I had to be in the army in 90 days. By the time that 90 days was there, I was ready for violent revolution. <laughs> and I, I, I hadn't thought about the Soviet Union at that point. I learned a lot more as I joined the Workers' World Party and, you know, learned all the things you need to learn, but I hadn't thought about the Soviet Union. The, the first time I thought about it for more than about 10 minutes was when, uh, in basic training, they brought us into a class and I was thinking of Johnny and Richard and Renee. I don't know if there are any other veterans. Uh, they might remember this. I was drafted, by the way, during the, the Vietnam War. You know, I pulled, you know, by my neck. You know, uh, they brought us into a class where a sergeant, I think, said, "Well, this class is to explain to you that a Russian agent may approach you <laughs> and ask you to spy." on a U.S. military installation and take pictures. And you should be aware of this because sometimes people have financial problems and personal problems, and the Soviet, the Russian agent, they wouldn't call them Soviet, they call them Russian. The Russian agent may offer you money. And I thought to myself, they wouldn't have to give me any money. <laughs> But then as I, as I knew more about the Russian Revolution and its relationship to the liberation movements, which Comrade Deirdre went over, 
supporting the African National Congress and the revolutionaries in Mozambique and Angola and Guinea-Bissau and, and Algeria and, and in Palestine and you know in the Americas all over the all over the world. He said, "Well, hey, this is this is pretty cool." And, and, and you know, one could give a talk about the relationship of the Black Liberation Movement to the Soviet Union. I'm not going to give that talk, but it would be worthy of a talk. All of the revolutionaries who went over there from this country and attended universities and got all sorts of support and how they felt about the Russian Revolution and how the biggest excitement over the Russian Revolution were amongst the black communists in Harlem and other ghettos. I'm talking about, you know, during that time, even the socialists who were not very revolutionary were worried about some of their black com comrades because they were excited about this revolution that they didn't know whether they supported. Artists and intellectuals loved it. Marcus Garvey, who was no communist, he was a black nationalist, probably a lot of you don't know a lot about him, uh, he was around in the 20s, maybe the early 30s, you know, finally was forced out of this country, died when he was young. Important thing about Marcus Garvey, actually Sam wrote about him. As famous and important as Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were, Marcus Garvey at his time and his movement were, were more influential and more popular amongst black people than any other black leader or black organization. And what he said, I'm paraphrasing, what he said about the Russian Revolution and his program was that, you know, we should go back to Africa. Okay, that's another topic. He said, what we need to do in Africa is what they did in Russia. <laughs> we need to have a revolution like that. Had tremendous influence on a lot of black nationalists, a lot of pan-Africanists. Maybe that was the later. So, you know, once, once I understood this, you know, and, and the way that I explained it, or attempted to explain it, to those comrades and friends who were there, was not to talk so much about the Soviet Union. Deirdre could have done that. She should have been there, and they should bring her there to do that. But I tried to put it into some kind of global context, some kind of historical context, because the revolution was not a local event. It was the opening of a new phase of the world struggle. Apart from what happened in the Soviet Union and how important that all is, it was the opening of a new phase of the world struggle. It was an opening of the world struggle for socialism, for revolution. People didn't know you could do it and hold on to it. The Soviet Union meant you could do it. And if you could do it there, maybe you could do it somewhere else. It affected the working class. It affected the attitude of unions and the militants and political parties. It affected splits in the movement, those who were for the revolution and those who were against it. That was a big split. Those who supported their imperialist uh, 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 masters and called themselves socialists and those who were anti-imperialists. That was another split. It was, it was big stuff that was happening that affected so much of what has happened in the global class struggle in relation to every issue you can imagine. It, 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 was, it was the beginning. I advise the comrades in Durham that they should get ready for what the capitalists are going to say on November 7th, a few days from now, uh, they'll use it as an opportunity to say, we won, the end of history. Capitalism, Trump socialism, and communism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I've been thinking about that. They, they'll probably do that to some extent, but they'll have to be more clever. They'll have to be more circumspect because they have a problem, and this is true. Capitalism is becoming more and more hated every day. 
And it would be very difficult for the prognosticators, the mouthpieces of capitalism, to go on and on and on about how great capitalism is now. The fact of the matter, the fact of the matter is that they're somewhat demoralized because they've lost the youth. And you know what they've lost the youth to? Socialism. That's right. This is a creeping, unspoken for the most part, but nonetheless incredible reality. This is what's happening. Every revolutionary has to understand this. Every revolutionary has to know this when they're planning what they're going to do. Because we have hundreds of millions of people on our side now who are just waiting to be called out. This is the situation that they face. I want to talk about something that I think a lot of attention is not given to. Jidra touched on it, and that is material conditions and how material conditions affected what happened in the Soviet Union, its contradictions, and how it got to a point where it couldn't go on. Our tendency, understandably so, our tendency is to blame internal factors. And this is important because we should not let anyone off the hook. Stalin, other generations of leadership in the Soviet Union, their errors, what they did or did not do, the bureaucracy, the disempowering of workers, no democracy for the workers. All of these things, we go on and on and on about that. See, we, I, 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 I'm saying that we shouldn't sweep all that under the rug as though we're not interested in that. That wouldn't work. That wouldn't be honest. But comrades, to just base your view on what happened on the internal developments in the Soviet Union would be contrary to Marxism as we understand it. It really would be. If you understand materialism, Materialism means that the internal processes are a factor, but external factors, any number of dynamics, have a role in what is happening to a living organism, be it a person, be it a country, be it an organization, be it a revolution. And this is how we must look at the life of the Soviet Union. It wasn't just the fact that as soon as the revolution was successful, it became isolated. What the Bolsheviks wanted, certainly what most of them wanted, what Lenin wanted, was that the revolution would spread to Europe. And just like the war had made the masses ripe for revolution in Russia, he thought that why, why shouldn't that be the case in other countries in Europe? That's a long, long discussion. It didn't happen. But when that didn't happen, and when those 14 imperialist armies invaded the Soviet Union, they were isolated. They had a lot of support, but it wasn't support that could help them materially. What I'm trying to show is that what happens outside of the Soviet Union affects the strength and weaknesses and vulnerability of the Soviet Union. The biggest historical problem for the Soviet Union, and this is argumentative, but I think that the leadership of Workers' World Party more or less holds this view. It certainly was Comrade Sam's view, that's where I learned. The biggest historical problem was not just the fact that the imperialists declared war on it. Military war, economic war, political war, covert, overt. You know, I was reading some, uh, a little bit about some book that came out recently 
where they actually isolated the 80s at a time when Reagan and the CIA said, let's take them down. That, that's true. Reagan and Thatcher and the CIA, let's outspend, let's outspend them militarily because they knew that that adversely affected the Soviet economy when they had to spend more money to defend themselves against a nuclear attack. They knew it. But there was another factor, and that factor was the development, or lack, or lack thereof, of the working class, especially in the imperialist centers. Since the end of the Second Imperialist War, the question on the minds of the most thoughtful revolutionaries and I count Sam Marcy, our founder and former leader, as first and foremost in that group, was when would the revolutionary struggle move from the East, the national liberation movements, Asia, Africa, etc., etc., to the West? When would it go to the imperialist centers where there were big developed working classes based on the level of the capitalist economy, the level of the productive forces. And that until that happened, until the revolutionary energy, whether it moved or just was shared, it could stay in the East. Although for, for many generations of revolutionaries, I'll tell you this, they became to rely on the East. They became to rely on the liberation movements. I always thought that was kind of unfair. So the oppressed should uh, uh, defeat imperialism on a global level. That's their job. They certainly want to do it. But, you know, we're giving it to them. The workers in this country got nothing to do with it. In Germany, in Britain, in France the strong centers of imperialism, where the banks are, they got no role in this. We're waiting for African and Asian and Palestinian and Arab and Latin American people to do it. <sighs> you know, that's idealistic, romantic, and I don't think it's Marxist, you know. I'm not criticizing a generation of revolutionaries who may have come up that way. That's, that's the way a lot of us probably thought it, you know. Maybe, well, well, what was Che's view? You know, actually, Che's view was dialectical. <laughs> if, if you keep battering at the, the, the outer ranges of imperialism, cutting them off here, Cuba here, Vietnam here, you know, one, two, three, many Vietnam, Vietnams, then sooner or later, you'll cause a heart attack at the imperialist centers. And he may have been on to something. At least that was his strategy. It's well thought out. He wrote about it. Yeah. The counter-revolution <laughs> that finally ended the Soviet Union was not just in the Soviet Union. The counter-revolution that ended the Soviet Union was not just in the Soviet Union. It was a global counter. It was a global counter-revolution that had been building and gaining momentum for quite some time. Capitalism was in a deep crisis coming out of the Vietnam War. And they had to do something. They had to restructure their economy. And they had to do it on the banks of the working classes, everywhere, but particularly at the imperialist centers. They had to globalize and introduce technology and break unions and pauperize large sections of the working class. In other words, they had to beat down the working class. And it was important to them. And the consequences were important. If you're a revolutionary of a certain age, you remember this. You remember the early 80s. You remember Reagan. You remember the, uh, the airport control, uh, 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 PACO. That was the first step. Break them. They were considered privileged, mostly white male workers. When Reagan broke them, that was a message. I will break a white male union. 
that's privilege. Imagine what I will do to you if you're lower down the scale. Thatcher, it was the coal miners, if I remember. You know? But these were just examples of, you know, the uh, sections of the working class that sort of stood out. It was everywhere. It was the shutting down of factories. It was the setting of factories away. It was globalization. It was in auto, it was in steel, it was in rubber, it was smokestack, it was everything. It affected everything. It's what we're living with. It's what people begin to call things like neoliberalism and, you know, and uh, other things. You know, it's capitalism. <laughs> I mean, I understand all those other terms, but comrades, really, it's just this phase of capitalism, you know, in a deep, deep, deep decay, in a deep, deep decline. That's what it is. You know, we ain't going back to some other part, you know, d despite Trump's delusions to a section of the working class. There were exceptions, of course, to this. France in 1968. You know, Greece, just a few years ago, you know, when for the first time, you, know, you woke up and said, wow, there might be a revolution in the European, you know, Portugal. In 1973, what abetted the final liberation of the Portuguese colonies was a revolution in Portugal. The army was involved in it, and the workers were involved in it, but it didn't go far enough. We have been dealing with this problem of the crisis of the development of the working class especially in the imperialist centers. In a way, and perhaps this is unfair, but sometimes generalities are what you have to deal with. In a way, the capitalists have been able for decades and decades and decades to sort of freeze, freeze the political development of the working class, freeze their political development, freeze the development of their organizations and make it difficult, if not impossible, for them to do what they need to do, and that is to develop into revolutionary organizations. I think freeze is a good word, perhaps, because part of what we're seeing now is the thaw. And in a funny kind of ironic way, even the election of Trump is to some extent based on the thought. Because when you've been frozen, when your consciousness has been frozen, and then all of a sudden something happens to you, where you get this painful thought, and you have to wake up, it's a traumatic experience, and you freak out. And I'm not blaming Trump on that alone, but part of a section of our class or the masses freaking out could do something stupid like help Trump get elected. That, that's not my explanation of Trump. That's just an interesting aside, you know. Maybe what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't be surprised if sections of our class are freaking out and going through something that they never thought they'd have to go through. Not just now, but for the last 30 years, which is the reason why they're taking more drugs and committing suicide and that the opioid epidemic is underplayed, and that the only reason that Trump spoke to it a few days ago is because it wasn't people of color, because they know what to do with people of color, put them in jail, kill them. But he's worried about, you know, another section of the working class, so he's got to, you know, he's got to handle that a little different way. All sorts of truth that's been pushed down is coming to, coming to the surface. I drafted an open letter to revolutionaries around the world. Uh, it's uh, on our paper's website. Maybe parts of it will be in the paper. I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, it is an open letter on how to commemorate the centennial of the Russian Revolution. It's a call, in short, for all those who know that capitalism, as soon as possible, 
must be pushed into the dustpan of history to recommit themselves to that. So that it's not something that's way back, you know, on the back burner and they don't even think about it. Bring it to a front burner. It may not happen tomorrow. It may not be what we have to do in six months. But don't push it so far back that it has no relevance. It has no validity. It has no strength. The crisis of capitalism that we're in requires that we remind ourselves that this system is hellish and that life is incompatible with it. And that it's an urgent necessity for us to do it in ASAP. We don't know how much time we have. A number of comrades are more expert on how quickly capitalism is making the environment, making the planet uninhabitable. I don't know what the latest, you know, verdict is. Do we have five years? Ten years? Something like that? You know, all over the world. You know? And when you, when you ponder the possibility of all these wars, in particular a war with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, People's Korea. Trump's over there now with the generals. See? I have a feeling, maybe I'm wrong, I have a feeling that a lot of good anti-imperialists are walking around sort of in a state of denial about this. Because it's just too heavy. It's just too overwhelming. The prospect of a war with People's Korea, which would be a war against Asia. It would be a war against China. It would be a war against both Koreas. The devastation, the catastrophic magnitude is unimaginable. How, how, how Asia could survive if there was a full-blown third world war there. I understand people who can't think about it. <laughs> in, or, in order to live and not go whatever, you know, we tend to try to chop things up so we can understand it. But as revolutionaries, sometimes we have to be truthful and face hard stuff. One of my proposals was reaffirm your commitment to socialist revolution. Not as taking you away from your day-to-day -day assignments, fighting to defend the oppressed and the working class, organize unions, fight white supremacy, fight imperialism, fight gentrification, you know, all the things that we're doing, go up to Columbia, you know, fight MTA, whatever, whatever you have to do, we know that. But just use this anniversary as an opportunity to sort of shine a light on that. If you can't shine a light on that, on the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, when is the time to do that? If you can't talk about the need and the urgency for revolution, and not in another 100 years, I don't know when, but sometime a lot shorter than 100 years. So short that maybe people in this room will be able to participate in it. Then what's the meaning of the anniversary? Maybe it's very presumptuous or audacious for our party to put out such a proposal. Revolution is audacious. Taking down statues is audacious. Shutting down white supremacist meetings is audacious. Shutting down MTA hearings is audacious. You know, this is, you know we know about that. You know, presumptuous, maybe. But it's a big anniversary, pretty damn big anniversary, the centennial of the Russian Revolution. We have to ask ourselves, if the Bolsheviks could talk to us, what would they want? How would they want us to, uh, you know, commemorate it? Oh, yeah, do a little, well, okay, it's a funeral service, that was nice, you know. How, what, what would Lenin say? I mean, we should feel a little responsibility. Don't you think so? We should feel a little bit of a responsibility. We're in the belly of the beast. It's still the belly of the beast. You know, and the working class in our neck of the woods 
for understandable and historical reasons that are changing, which is why we're optimistic, they haven't been able to help out, if you understand what I'm saying, on a global level. So I think we owe the Bolsheviks, and I think we owe Lenin and all the revolutionary leaders, all those who died, all those who didn't live long lives, all those who suffered whatever hell they had to walk through to achieve the revolution and defend it. I think we owe them something. And maybe I'm not explaining it the way that it should be explained, but it's something along the lines that I'm trying to explain. I also call for revolutionaries to search in a very serious way for a higher level of unity without knowing the form that that unity would take. Without describing that, whether it would be a new organization, a merger of political parties, or a united front, or a, a new revolutionary international, big words, big things, big, they, big, these are easy things to say, but they have no serious, they have no meaning until something makes revolutionaries do this. And an anniversary in and of itself, I mean, let's face it, is not enough. Anniversaries are what you make of them. But I'll tell you what, anniversaries are political. They're political for both sides of the class struggle. They're political for the imperialists, and they're political for the workers and the oppressed. You know, so we should look at it and use it that way. Now, of course, the thing that people can do, in our view, right away, is join the Workers' World Party. We need to strengthen our party, as we have been all over the country. But we have a long view. We have a long view, and we are not, we are not sectarian. There are no obstacles or obstructions that are, 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 that are, that are, that are messing with our view. We know that to do big things, you're going to have to have big forces. We know that you're going to have to work with progressive forces, some of whom will never be revolutionary, but you have to work with them. We know you're going to have to work with trade unionists, some will become revolutionaries, others never will, but that's the struggle. See? And we know that we can't call for the revolution because that would be foolish and no one would come. <laughs> and that it's a distance from here to here, whatever that distance is. But we try in our imperfections and our presumptuousness. We try to be serious. We try to be honest. We try to lay it out as we see it. So that when the time comes, we will be a revolutionary and honest participant at the table of revolutionary unity. Short of that, there are a lot of things we have to do. It's not my job to talk about that. We've got our conference coming up. And probably one of the big things we're going to be talking about at our Workers' World Party Conference in Newark is what's our next step to defend the oppressed, the immigrants, the Muslims, people of color, women, LGBTQ people, and also the workers. Also the workers. What's our next step? So think a lot about that because when we come out of that conference, we want to come out on fire. Long live the October Revolution. Wow.